everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We will be covering how organizations can react at hyperspeed to the rapidly changing global landscape. My name is Ehsan, and I am the head of marketing at Actorius. With me today is Actorius CEO Martin Fredke and Anders Leo Lindberg, the co founder of Business Partnering Institute, both of whom, being in the planning and analytics space for decades now, bring unique perspective and insights on the topic today. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your control panel. Martin will be answering questions at the end. You can also access some relevant handouts within your control panel, which include a solution brief on planning at hyperspeed, an overview of the Actorius platform, and a security and governance brief. You will also receive a recording of this webinar a day after the event. Now, without further ado, I will turn the time over to Martin. Over to you. Thank you. Hello and welcome everyone uh, to this uh, webinar on planning at hyperspeed, where we will be discussing trends um, in planning in very changed environments. My name is Martin Kratke. I'm the uh, CEO of uh, Actaris and Managility. Um, our organization specializes uh, in all aspects of planning and data model automation. So we typically help organizations to improve uh, processes uh, from an efficiency perspective, but then also from uh, a time to react perspective, which uh, as we will hear in, in, in our session today is a crucial uh, capability in, in very uh, dynamic times. And we do this through uh, two products uh, that we have. Uh, one is uh, what we call the Actaris Apps range, which is uh, an end-to-end -end solution for particular source systems, uh, for predominantly uh, finance systems like uh, Zero, NetSuite, QuickBooks, and other ones, but equally other systems like uh, Stripe, uh, CRM systems like HubSpot. So here we offer end-to-end -end solutions where it automatically builds the data warehouse um, optimized for analysis and the reports. So in the end, within minutes, you get uh, reports like this that consolidate the entities that you've added and you have all the analytics uh, power either in, in Power BI or in Excel. And the second uh, range um, is our enterprise uh, product segment called XBNA Suite, which adds um, very advanced planning capabilities covering all aspects of planning in a unified way to Power BI and Excel. But now, with, uh, without any further ado, I would like to introduce um, our speaker today, one of the foremost thinkers in this space. Uh, I'm very happy to have uh, Anders Liu Lindberg with me, the founder of the Business Partnering Institute. Anders, do you want to say a few words uh, and introduce yourself? Absolutely, Martin, and uh, and thanks a lot for for having me here today. Uh, really excited about talking on, on on the planning topic. I think it's something that uh, companies uh, spend uh, spend a lot of time on, and something that needs uh, probably uh, probably some change and and transformation. And it's something I, I talk about a lot to my 100,000 followers on, on LinkedIn and in my uh, my blog as well with 160,000 subscribers. We've also published uh, several ebooks on this uh, topic. So we really just want to, to help finance professionals create a bigger impact in, in their companies. And, and we do this through training and consulting and, and writing a lot and, and speaking a lot about these these topics here. So, so really excited about uh, being here today, Martin, and thanks for, for having me. Perfect, no, uh, thank you very much, Anders. So um, the, the background of, of our web, webinar today are the dramatic changes that have happened uh, in recent years, uh, particularly in a post-pandemic world and where supply chains are severely impacted. We now have uh, the challenges of um, extremely high rising energy prices um, and a lot of other challenges. And what we want to do in this um, webinar today is discuss uh, how does this affect uh, planning processes? Can you do planning uh, in the same way uh, as you've done it in the past? Or do these uh, very uh, dramatic changes require a different approach uh, for planning? So 
my my first question to you, Anders, would be, what are your thoughts um, in view of these uh, rapid changes across the business landscape? How does it affect planning, uh, forecasting, and related processes? Yeah, so so I think you know rapid change is is the normal. I don't think we should you know continue saying that oh now things are changing faster and and how do we act to this? I think we should accept that this is the normal or as McKinsey would say we live in the world of the next normal there's always something unexpected happening which means we should expect the unexpected we don't know exactly what that unexpected is but we know it's coming at us so uh, any any company or individual that's unwilling to accept this fact they will they will struggle to to perform in, in today's world and that also need, means we seriously need to professionalize our approach to, to risk and opportunity management so we can increase our readiness to act. It can't mm -hmm. just be a silo team anymore that sits in corporate and do some risk management and sends out some, some questionnaires. No, you know, risk and opportunity management needs to be on everyone's agenda. And we need to treat risks and opportunity equally. I think, you know, finance professionals in particular, which are the ones that, that I usually talk to and, and, and try to, to help in, in today's world, they at least have a, a, a history of mostly looking at risks and thinking that risks are bad and something we need to, to eliminate. And uh, while some risk, of course, uh, is, is bad and, and we shouldn't take those risks, it's much more about finding out what are the right risks to take in our business. Because if we don't take risk, we're certainly not going to make any interesting returns for our shareholders. Uh, so finding out those right risks to take is is critical, and I think that's that's a paradigm shift that that we need to make in in the finance function at least. So uh, it's it's the normal this kind of world that that we have, and you know we might not be hit by a by a pandemic for the next uh, ten years again, but then we're hit by something else. And you mentioned a lot of good examples in your intro here, Martin. So you know this this is not new. This is normal, and we need to accept that fact. Thank you, um, and and one of the key uh, areas where businesses face challenges uh, in in performance management in in twenty twenty two. Yeah, so I think there there's a couple of things here, right? Uh, the key challenge to to planning at speed is is that the, uh, the the speed of change globally keeps accelerating, right? This is now the normal, but it just means that the acceleration continues. The challenge is, of course, that most planning and performance management processes, they have not followed suit. You know, if I ask companies, are you still doing a budget? 93% says yes. And uh, obviously, you can be all fast and nimble about your, your budget process. But in most companies, it's a three to, to five months process from you start with the first assumptions until the board has, has approved it. And in three to five months, I mean, so many different things can can happen. And that simply means that companies act slower than things evolve around them. And then we miss opportunities to acquire new businesses or go into new business areas or launch new products, or we run into avoidable risks. I mean, there's so many risks that are hitting us that we could have avoided in some shape or form. You know, we couldn't have foreseen exactly how the pandemic would, would develop. But when the first kind of challenges started to, to hit, uh, let's say, in, in, in Asia, then companies should already there start to say, okay, you know, what would happen? What should we do if it starts to hit Europe or uh, US, for instance? What, what should we do? Then it might happen so that it didn't hit Europe and US, and then you can leave your plans in the door. But if you don't have a plan for what happens, you're going to be left completely paralyzed for a couple of months, right? The, the second challenge is that many companies, unfortunately, still operate in a siloed manner, which means that there's no great connection between financial, operational, and commercial plans. You know, finance do their thing, sales do their thing, and, and operations do, do their thing. And if... You know, even if there is a connection, it takes too long to establish. It's also why budget processes take so long because you have to wait for every function to do their plan and they need to discuss the plans and then you need to consolidate and then senior management is not happy and you make changes and you need to discuss and so on and so forth, right? So we need to 
we need to connect all these things in order to uh, to be ready to 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 act when we need to. And then finally, if we zoom in on on finance, I think a key challenge here is that most performance management processes they are focused on the past, meaning financial data. And you know, while we can make some improvements and get some insights from only looking at the financials, that's really no way to improve future performance. And that's what business leaders are looking for. They want insights that can help them make better decisions. They don't need so much the past financial data that more or less just confirm what they already know, just adding a decimal or two to their, uh, to their, to, to their knowledge, right? So we need to look forward. We need to make assessments about the future risks and opportunities and stop focusing so much on the past. Cool. No, thank you, Anders. That, that's very interesting. So you mentioned the challenges and and where do you see are the, the major roadblocks uh, to address these challenges in organizations at the moment? And what are ways to overcome them? Is it is it a technology exercise? Is it uh, processes? Does it require different people? Does it require more involvement? You already mentioned um, it, the planning needs to move away from a fairly siloed process that just covers and is, is owned by finance. The planning process needs to be owned by uh, other business functions uh, in the organization as well. So, so I think, you know, first and foremost, I've, I've run a poll a few times on, on LinkedIn where I do a lot of uh, work and, and content creation, asking finance people, which is, is my audience, you know, what's stopping us from creating that future of finance that we all want to create and we have that we have in our transformation plans and our visions and mission and all that. And, you know, because you asked about technology and process and, and, and people, and the fourth element to that is, is the mindset. So when I say uh, people, I mean, you know, do you have the skills and training you need to do your job? Whereas the mindset is our way to think. And uh, very consistently, I ran it a year ago, I ran it uh, a few weeks ago, very consistently, and it's it's almost crazy, but it's the exact same number, even to even a year apart. 62% says it's our mindset that's blocking us from creating that future. And that, that goes for anything, also the planning process, of course. So we simply, we need a, what uh, leading management thinker Roger Martin would call a new way to think, right? We need to reset our mindset and do things differently. Because if you don't reset your mindset, you know, you can have great technology platforms and planning platforms like, like Actarius, right? But people won't know how to use it, right? Or they won't be ready to use it, right? So it, it starts with that mindset. And then of course, you know, the planning processes should change. It should be better enabled by, by technology and need to train people in, in how to use it. But it really starts with the mindset. That, that's what needs to change. Uh, thank you, Anders. And, and, and do you agree with these uh, changes in, in the environment so that uh, uh, it's becoming way more dynamic than it used to be. You, you can't predict uh, what will happen in a few days before it was reasonably predictable. Uh, do you agree that uh, the, the speed of the planning process um, needs to change? Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, I'd say overall it takes relatively long for companies to adjust to these unexpected events, right? When when COVID hit uh, hit, hit Europe, for instance, uh, most companies they they stopped making decisions for for six months between February to to August. They simply lack visibility and action plans to address the challenge uh, challenges of doing let's say business during a health crisis. And it could of course be different kind of crises that they didn't have have plans for. And we can always discuss if it's fair to expect that they should be able to do so. However, the fact remains that most companies thought that they were going to be hit hard, but only a few industries actually took big hits, whereas many performed as expected or even outperformed their expectations for the year already in 2020. And certainly in 2021, I think we have seen a lot more upgrades of, uh, of financial performances than we've seen downgrades in, in 2021. And obviously the, the stock market probably also, also confirms that. And, and one of the reasons it, it, it takes so long to adjust is that the the processes, they, they break down, right? So planning can no longer be done in, in the system because, you know, the system is set to a specific rhythm. So, you know, during the pandemic, for instance, that rhythm needed to increase in frequency. So if you were used to doing a quarterly forecast, now you need to do a monthly. If it was monthly, now you need to do weekly and so on and so on. So what happened, you know, companies, they they went back to, to Excel. So when you 
ask if the speed needs to change absolutely but we're also struggling with the you know our processes and, and systems not being able to to cope with this so people basically had to work uh, extreme long hours fpna professionals which is also one of uh, my core uh, core audience groups they said that they you know, that they never worked as much as they did uh, during uh, during the pandemic they were crazy busy just trying to get some sort of visibility and and most of the work was really just manual especially in those first uh, few uh, few three to five uh, months so yes it's, it's absolutely critical that we we increase the, the speed i mean companies they should be able to re forecast the essentials in just a few days to take stock of a situation and and decide how to, to act on it and of course the speed then can be the difference between winning and losing versus competition mm -hmm. and uh you know, we often think that competition they have it all figured out and it's only us that are struggling but in reality everyone is struggling i mean very very few companies probably have plans in the drawer for what to do in a scenario like like the pandemic right so everyone was like scrambling figuring out what what do we do but if you can act a few weeks faster because your process is more flexible and agile that makes a difference in today's world so mm -hmm. um it, it, it's you know critical to act decisively and be comfortable with making these decisions under not just uncertainty because we've always made decisions on uncertainty but the uncertainty has become greater than it used to be. And we just need to accept that fact and be comfortable with it. If we want to make you no know, wait until we have a 99% data driven decision, we'll never make any decision, right? It's just not, just not possible. Mm -hmm. And so, so you mentioned people were reverting to their Excel ways. Where do you see the, the key challenges with this? Is it that um, they're working with disconnected data, so they're copy and pasting data into, into a spreadsheet and it takes a lot of effort to maintain these things? Or where are the, the key problems that, that uh, users of, of spreadsheet-based uh, processes, or disconnected spreadsheet-based pro processes face? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, when 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 most companies have a some sort of a planning system, right? I mean, some have more uh, bigger, let's say, installations or cloud-based uh, systems than than others. But 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 most of them are sort of they're they're set to how the company planning cycle is 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 operating. And so, if they need to adjust something, for instance, the the frequency, right, from monthly to weekly or quarterly to to monthly, it's it's not something you you just do. It probably takes, uh, uh, you know, some some consultants to come in to adjust some dimensions and whatnot. And when you when you're faced with these unexpected situations that you need to act fast, it, it's just not happening, right? So if you suddenly have a new requirement to say, hey, you know, we need to understand what's going on with our accounts receivables, just to give an example, because now we are uncertain whether our clients can actually uh, pay on time or pay at all. Then you know you send you make a simple Excel template and then you send that around to uh, to to all the, the the entities you have in your your company and you ask for, for input and they will send it back and some will make you know their own lines in in those Excel sheets because it didn't fit exactly how how they wanted to look at things and then consolidating that becomes a nightmare. It's manual now. You can't just add it all up and then errors pop up and you have to check and recheck and this this process it it, it doesn't really work but it's. It's the only thing companies really, really had in this situation. So, so we need tools that are much more flexible and ideally something that the uh, the individuals in the finance team or other teams can make these, uh, these these adjustments and say, okay, well, now we need to do this weekly. What does that mean? That means we need to add three lines here. We need to add a dimension. That's done. Okay, you know, send out uh, a new instruction to uh, to to the users of of how to do this so that we avoid these ad hoc Excel sheets that needs to be uh, be floated around the system uh, or, or, or the company, because it's not it's not a way to plan. Let, let's just agree. Hmm. No, I, I totally agree with you there. And that's, that's exactly what we see as well. And that's we see that the key challenge is that uh, users, uh, as opposed to working with a with a single data model where all the relevant uh, parts are incorporated, they have these uh, disconnected uh data dumps if i may call them that in in excel 
um, and, and so we see a lot of benefit um, if even if if you want to continue using Excel, Excel is a great tool for a flexible analysis. Um, as opposed to storing data in Excel, you work with essential data model and everyone works with the same data model. So if you've, for example, you can remove the the entire process of sending out templates and collecting templates and then adding up the templates up, uh, up again. If you have all this in a in a central data model, uh, everyone has access to this in real time. They can change something. Everyone else will see, you know, the, what's the current uh, state uh, of the model. And we typically see that this is this is very beneficial, and potentially even more so if you use um, uh, high-end analytics tool like like, like Power BI. So the users would again work with the same data model. Uh, but then have uh, very advanced an analytics and visualization capabilities in there and uh, potentially also the, the planning capabilities that, that, that Terrace adds. Um, would you say uh, this is um, this this could be helpful in in, in, in planning processes to, to to be able to react quicker? Oh, ab ab absolutely. I mean, uh, as I said, it, it, it's the difference between winning and losing. You know, maybe, you know, talking about days is, is probably uh, probably exaggerating the issue, right? But, you know, will you make a decision today, a week from now, or three weeks from now? I think most can agree that that actually makes a difference in a fast moving world that, that we have here. So, mm -hmm. um, I think it's critical uh, from from my from my point of view. Mm -hmm. so, and, so, and you said th this uh, reacting uh, not quickly enough can lead to some some major problems. Have you got some examples for this that you've uh, seen recently? Yeah, just just sharing two uh, two two examples. Maybe one is uh, is macroeconomic that I think we can all relate to, and one is from uh, from 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 my previous uh, work at the, in, in in the shipping uh, shipping business. So I think you know right now we see uh, a a high inflationary world that we haven't seen in a in a generation. I think is is, is probably fair to say, uh, and most commentators and economists would probably agree that that central banks have been way too slow acting on this uh, even you know the fed that's probably acting the the fastest have also been quite slow they've been caught off guard with how big this inflationary problem actually actually was but i mean we've seen all the signs come <laughs> right the energy prices have been high and rising for a while the uh the the, the ukraine russia war has has been building up for a while and then of, until it actually you know the, happened uh, so all the signs were there, but it, it really seemed like on, on the commentary from the, the heads of central banks that they were like, we were monitoring this, but we didn't think it was going to be that serious. Now it's probably just going to be a temporary thing. And then, oh, maybe now it's a bit more permanent. We need to act. Oh, now it's really big issue. We need to hike up the rates like we've never seen before almost. Um, and it kind of feels like that was acting very slow and while you know governmental or institutions often act slower than companies it, it's it's been really really slow right so i think that's a great example of how a better planning process and a better risk and opportunity uh process would have helped central banks to take more decisive action uh, so that was a let's say a macroeconomic example uh looking at it from a more company perspective um I used to work in a in, in a shipping business, and uh, and therefore we were also very uh, dependent on uh, all price uh, all price uh, fluctuations. Um, while we were trying to pass on some of the the cost to to our customers, it it was not always easy, right? Especially not when 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 changes happen fast. So so we had a we had a situation where um, where, where changes in in what we call the bunker price, which is the fuel that that the vessels would use. It was it was changing changing fast and it was increasing quite a lot and uh we were in the middle of a forecasting process and uh we couldn't really cater for this in the system so someone had to make that kind of excel based uh, template that we had to get uh you know uh, the commercial teams to to work in and it was not really working so well and there was many errors in the template and went back and forth and and we had to as as, as finance business partners calculate the potential impact of the rising uh, prices if we didn't do anything. And we were sort of like, you know, it was 
it was seven hundred million dollars uh, plus minus that 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 the impact could be. So thinking about this, you know, you have an Excel based ad hoc process with a seven hundred million dollar risk. Uh, that's that, that uh, I wouldn't be comfortable if I was the business leader using such, that kind of process. So obviously we needed to, to, to have something better to, to cater for a process like this. Uh, otherwise we risk uh, losing a lot of money or not being able to pass it on to, to our customers. So I think those are two, uh, two good examples from two different perspectives of how, you know, being able to, to plan fast, efficiently with the right tools makes a big difference for, for companies and, and the world overall. Perfect, Anderson. Thank you very much. I thought this, this might be a good um, segue into showing a little bit um, of, of what we're doing in this space, just as a, as a, as a very quick example. So what you see here, this is uh, the standard Power BI environment that uh, is now the leading analytics solution in the world. But uh, what we are adding to this are these capabilities that you were just talking about. So the, the opportunity to really in seconds simulate as many uh, scenarios as you want to. So I can uh, have multiple scenarios here, I can create new ones, and then immediately test these things. So, so I can see here, for example, these are the, the quantities, the forecasted quantities. I can see the comparison to targets. Uh, I can see here other influence factors like what you just mentioned before, prices, so the, the prices that we are assuming uh, for our product. And I can see the, uh, the the resulting indicators. I can see, okay, what's what are the total sales? What's the gross margin? And then we also have other influence factors like tariff changes, currency changes, and so on. And the users can then directly here in a very easy way, even in a, in a chart, adjust, uh, for example, assumptions or do this directly in the, the old tables that they know from Excel. For example, simulating a price increase to let's say 3000 until the end of the year and immediately see what are the implications uh, of these changes. So just, just as a very quick uh, demonstration, uh, how can you implement planning where, you know, this is obviously a, report that is used by any Power BI user in the organization. This can be hundreds, thousands of users. They all work on the same data model and they can then see uh, immediately the influence factors and also collaborate on it. So they can add comments why they made these assumptions and that uh, the co collaboration really improves and it, it avoids the Excel chaos that, you know, you, you work with hundreds of spreadsheets that are flying around, uh, but here everything moves to the one central model. You have uh, easy uh, to use um, uh, screens where you can simulate your scenarios and, and see the, uh, the outcomes uh, with as, as good as possible visualizations, um, but also have then the option to adapt this to your needs. So as opposed to using expensive uh, FPNA systems, you, this is the normal Power BI environment where there's a lot of knowledge available. And if you want to adjust something here, for example, add a new um, dimension where you say, I would like to have this now on an organizational level, you can just drag it into it and change uh, the, the planning process. Obviously not everyone will be able to do this, but as opposed to having expensive experts, um, the business users can do these things themselves. So this just as a quick segue into it. Um, but my next question would be now, so we have uh, already addressed that one of the challenges is that planning is not solely owned by finance anymore. There's a variety of different um, departments and roles involved. How, in your view, can businesses overcome these challenges to move away from these planning silos to, to a more holistic, unified world? So, so, so a couple of points here, Martin. I think first and foremost, it requires that someone takes responsibility for aligning the planning processes across the company right uh historically finance and the pna has held this role however in in my opinion the the approach that that we have taken to this has been wrong we have been dictating how things should should happen and we have forced other functions into our way of working and uh, you know how it goes if you try to force people to do something, maybe they'll do it once, but they definitely won't do it uh, twice or, or the third time. So 
in, in, in large parts, this has led to most functions like you know, sales and, and marketing and operations, just doing the minimum to satisfy the requirements of finance and then have continued their own planning process on, on the side, even without inviting finance to the table. So this, this obviously presents a huge challenge if you're trying to, uh, to plan holistically and, and make, the, make decisions considering all key parts of the company. Um, so aside from, from having a strong alignment of the process, it also requires that the, pl the planning process run on the same platform, right? So that we all, uh, we all part of the same thing. And that has less like a seamless integration between, uh, between platforms. So if you have like an operational, uh, system that you need to, to run your day-to-day -day business, that's also aligned with what's happening on, on the planning platform, for instance. Um, so we need that kind of transparency in terms of where the numbers come from. Otherwise it's. You know, it, it, it's impossible to get this done in, in in Excel, for instance, if we need that, you know, if we need Excel as sort of like an intermediate between all the systems, which by all means happens in lots of companies, right? You mentioned data dump yourself earlier, right? So you know, we dump the data from the different systems, we put it into Excel, we do something to it, and then we upload it into the planning consolidation system. And that's um, also a pretty erroneous uh, process, if, if, if you ask me. So so a couple of things needed, uh, needed there for sure. And I, of course, firmly believe that finance and FPA should own this, but we just need to we need to take a, a different approach to it. We cannot beat people in in into the ranks. We need to uh you know align and and, and partner with them to uh, to create win-win situations and something that everyone benefits from. Cool. No thanks thanks a lot um and just in just maybe I'll might move into another quick example um, because we, we were slagging Excel a little bit, but I think um, there is also uh, still an argument for Excel. So as you can see here um, on, on this screen, this is the normal Excel environment, but you are connected to a central data model. People have the familiar spreadsheet, but it is connected uh, to the data model. So if I want to switch here now and see the data from a different company, I can immediately do this here in Excel and get the right data. So as opposed to having hundreds of Excel sheets flying around, everything happens in the same spreadsheet, but the spreadsheet is connected to a central data model that is administrated by user rights. So the users will only, even if they use, use the Excel spreadsheet, they will only see what they're allowed to see. And everyone is working on the same data as opposed to a lot of spreadsheets uh, all have their version of the data. And then the, the issues that you have also with uh, consolidating this. So here, the data model would, automatically consolidate across, for example, account groups or organizations or whatever it is. So you don't have to worry anymore about maintaining the, uh, the model. The, the process is pretty much automatic. So if you have set up even in Excel, you, you, you can do it in a smart way if, if you work with the central data model, which leads me to the, the final question. What's, what are the crucial things that an XPA platform, uh, like uh, Ectaris plays in, in enabling uh, planning at hyperspeed and, and, and better decision making uh, for real world actions? So, I mean, from my perspective, doing planning at speed really requires that we all work on the same platform. It doesn't mean that everything in a company can come into one system. I mean, we can, of course, have a different system to use for, for different, different purposes, but we need to have that common platform for the planning process that we're all working on. Of course, the challenge is that when the most often different functions run their processes on separate platforms, like, you know, sales, they might have Salesforce, operations might have like a warehouse management system and procurement has another system to manage supplier contracts and so on and so forth. And there's no good intermediary system between these. And this is why companies often resort to Excel, right? So think like uh, having an XPNA uh, platform is, is is going to be uh, really important. And that's, that's what I see that, uh, is, is being enabled these years. I don't think we had it so well maybe years back, uh, but but now we are getting more and more platforms that can that can deliver this. Um, so you know, if we can get the, at least the planning process on on the same platform, then companies can can start to act with uh, with, with speed, right? Um, it's just important that that any planning that takes place on the the unified platform is still linked to each of the operational systems in, in each of the functions. Otherwise, we're going to have a, a disconnect and we're going to be spending a lot of time again trying to, to reconcile data and, and the numbers, which is not where we want to be be spending our time. So it's, uh, yeah, that's 
I definitely see that as something that that we need to to have, and an XBNA platform is going to play a crucial role in that. Perfect. Thank thank you very much, Anders, for these uh, really insightful uh, comments. Everybody, um, please let me know if anybody has any questions. We have actress CEO Martin Cricket with us, as mentioned, and also our head of revenue operations. Just feel free to post your questions here. Uh, alternatively, you can just email us and we will send you your responses as soon as we can. Thank you for attending. Okay, if not, that will be the end of this webinar. Thank you. You will receive a recording for this session uh, within 24 hours.